Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Uh, it's a webinar where we talk about Lyme disease. Um, I look forward to seeing what you have in store for me tonight, because you create these webinars with your questions. For those of you that are back again, I see many familiar uh, names on my message board. So I'm glad to see that you're getting benefit and that you have value from this and that you keep returning. And I hope I can keep providing you some benefit uh, for being here as well, too. For those of you that are new, uh, the way you participate, there's two ways. One is you can just participate by listening to the, the questions and the answers and, and see if you get something beneficial out of that. Uh, the other thing you could do is write a question to me. And the way you do that is over on the right-hand side of your screen at the bottom is a chat box that you can uh, write your question to me through. The only thing I ask is that you keep the question short. This format does not work out well for me to hear your whole life story, if you will, and, uh, and all the uh, details of, of your health problem. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and then, um, and that you actually send a complete question to me only when it's done by clicking your enter key. So don't use your enter key to try to create a bunch of new paragraphs because it sends multiple questions by direction and that gets very difficult from this side. I am creating a recording of today's webinar and it will be ready, I anticipate, tomorrow morning, although I've got um, some issues that may get in the way of me having it ready first thing in the morning, but my intention would be that it's on its way to you uh, somewhere uh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> That's the best I can say for now. Um, I hope to have it up and, and to you somewhere probably by around 7 a.m. in the morning. So uh, we'll see how that goes in terms of my ability to be able to edit it this evening and get it out to you, okay? Um, and then uh, during the webinar tonight, I am going to read your questions. But for those of you that are participating in the live version of the webinar, I'm actually going to post those questions so you can see them on your screen. Um, and, but I'm still going to read them out loud because they don't show up in the recorded version. OK. All right. So without. Oh, and then one last thing. Um, I will not be able to get through all the questions tonight, uh, just so you know, but I will try to work through as many as I can and um, we'll see where we get to, okay? All right, so I'm uh, glad to see you're all here and let's go ahead and get started. So this first question is from Brandy. Let's see, it looks like, let's see, it mentioned it worked with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, my, myalgia encephalitis, that's chronic fatigue syndrome, everyone in the past, what were some of your discoveries? Were there situations where it was poor mitochondrial genetics that make us susceptible? I was reading about Alpine Village where everyone got uh, chronic uh, fatigue syndrome and was curious on your take on the possibilities. I asked because I feel like I had chronic fatigue syndrome even before I had a bullseye tick rash and acquired Lyme, a Babdesia and BART. Okay. So let me just talk briefly about a chronic fatigue syndrome and or what, uh, especially in, Eng in England and uh, across the pond here, if you will, is referred to as myalgia and myalgic encephalitis. Um, so chronic fatigue syndrome is really a grab bag. It's a condition where people have severe fatigue and immune dysfunction and some um, cognitive dysfunction, sometimes associated with body pains, sometimes not. It's a spectrum. On the other side of that would be people that might have the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, where they have a lot of muscle achiness predominantly and a limited uh, fatigue. Um, so it's, it's two ends of a pole, basically. Um, but when we diagnose somebody with chronic fatigue syndrome, it means that we don't know why. Okay, It's a syndrome. It's a constellation of symptoms, but we don't have a solid explanation for it. I have found that for a lot of people, though, there are things that are part of it that we can do to get people better. And so one of those can be chronic infections. And so if, um, and a lot of doctors don't know to look for these. So sometimes in some people, it might be that they've got too many yeast living in their intestines. In other people, it might be they have chronic virus infections. In some people, they've been wrongly diagnosed as having uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, but what they really have is Lyme disease triggering all of these symptoms, okay? So we have to look for what the underlying causes are, and there can be many. Um, there can be sleep disturbance, there can be mold toxin illness, there can be um, mitochondria dysfunction, there can be um, um, yeast living in the intestines, there can be groups of chronic infections, 
Um, and my approach generally is to correct for a lot of those. So in, I'm treating somebody, evaluating somebody for chronic fatigue. If they have sleep disturbances, I want to get their sleep um, normalized. Number two, I'm always trying to consider, is there an infection as part of this? Number three, I'm always screening for chronic yeast overgrowth in the intestines. Number four, I'm looking for um, a mold toxin illness that uh, might they might have mold toxins trapped in them causing this. Um, number, uh, I think five or six now, um, I'm going to do things to evaluate their thyroid and adrenal glands. And even if blood testing is normal, I still might give thyroid and adrenal medicines to help normalize what clinically it looks like low thyroid. Um, I am going to do things to support the uh, mitochondria function. Anyhow, I'm going to address a lot of things. And I find if you address all those things that I just described, many people with what have been diagnosed as chronic fatigue syndrome actually get better because um, it might be that there are multiple factors adding together, multiple illnesses, conditions adding together to get the fatigue. Okay, so that's kind of what my experience was. But I will also say in my uh, practice in uh, Washington D or in uh, Washington State, um, actually I moved here from Washington DC, but in Washington State, I, I went into independent practice back in 2000 and started focusing on, a, um, I added acupuncture into my practice, which started attracting a lot of people with fibromyalgia. And eventually that brought in people with chronic fatigue syndrome, especially since I was working with natural medicines and acupuncture. And gradually over time, by 2004, my practice pretty much became a chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia practice. In um, 2004, one of my patients asked me if I would test her for Lyme disease. And at that time, I was not Lyme knowledgeable. Um, I am now, but back then I was not. And I, so I wound up testing her and her test came back positive and it really had me scratching my head. I thought, oh my God, I wonder if I am missing a lot of Lyme disease here. So I went and tested all of my patients in a practice that was uh, a uh, chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia practice. And I found that about 30% tested positive for Lyme disease, okay? I think if we were to do that kind of testing out in the East Coast here in the States where there's a bigger prevalence of Lyme, it would probably even be a higher percentage. So my, my thing to think that I usually suggest for people that have a diagnosis of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia is make sure you've done a high quality Lyme test. And I don't mean using, uh, going to like LabCorp or Quest, I mean a high quality Lyme disease test. And the one that I like using these days is a test uh, by Igenix. Uh, it is their uh, Lyme immunoblot test. The reason I like that test is they're looking to see if you have antibodies uh, made against eight strains of Lyme. Okay, if you go to LabCorp and Quest and get their Lyme testing, they're only looking to see if you have antibodies against one strain of Lyme, okay? So they're gonna miss a lot of stuff. So you wanna do a high quality test. And that's why I reckon, recommend the Igenix Immunoblot that based on their validation studies has the ability to find Lyme if it's in you about 95% um, um, of the time, okay? So it's a good test, all right? So to kind of, so I guess what I would say is, Chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgia, encephalitis, fibromyalgia really is a grab bag diagnosis for a lot of people that has multiple components, um, as I went through earlier, and you got to address all of them. And often you can make a big difference for people. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Brandy. Hello, Katie. Um, hello, Dr. Ross. Um, thank you for taking time to answer my questions. You're welcome. Uh, blood work from MDL Labs in New Jersey recently came back with an IgG positive result for Bartonella hensili. I also have a positive mold result from Great Plains Lab. My doctor has prescribed 500 milligrams of Zithromax daily. It is also recommended that I take uh, MC bar one drop from Beyond Balance, GI detox from Biobotanical Research, and a daily probiotic. I'm also taking Tri-Fortified daily along with lots of vitamins. Does this sound like a complete regimen to address the Bartonella and mold? Um, so um, it sounds like a good regimen. Um, let me just make a few comments. So if we look at, um, so for mold, um, the type of, you, so the idea with mold toxicity, 
is that 25% of all people um, have a genetic programming mistake where they're gen genetically their immune system is not programmed to get rid of mold toxins. So if we are in an environment where we breathe in mold toxins, they get absorbed into our bloodstream. And 75% of us, some of our immune cells will see those toxins and they'll tag them, okay? And then other immune cells will come in and break those mold toxins down and they never bother us. But if you're one of the 25% that have a genetic problem, those white blood cells don't tag those mold toxins. Those mold toxins don't get broken down. They go to the liver. The liver is supposed to take these toxins, which are fat-based toxins, and transform them into a water-soluble or water-dissolvable toxin. But the liver doesn't know how to handle mold toxins either, all right? So they go to the liver fat-based, they come out fat-based, and out in the intestines, because they're fat-based, they get reabsorbed right back into your bloodstream. So you just get this endless loop of toxins going around. So what you want to do with mold toxin illness is grab hold of those toxins out in the intestines and pull them out. One of the natural ways to do it would be to use a binder that, um, that will grab hold of them. And binders can be things like activated charcoal, zeolite, bentonite clay. The GI detox that they're suggesting for you has primarily activated charcoal and clay in it. And between the clay and the activated charcoal, that'll pick up a broad number of types of mold toxins that can uh, be get trapped in you, okay? On the other hand, if you were to have some testing done, a urine test done that shows you what kind of toxins are trapped in you, you can more better, you can better target which one you use. So for instance, if your urine mycotoxin testing came back showing you that you have predominantly um, okra toxin in you, which is a mold toxin that comes from aspergillus, you would probably just want to use activated charcoal, okay? If your urine test came back showing you predominantly had a toxin called gliotoxin, you would primarily want to use a betonite clay, or clay would be the thing to use, all right? But if you have a wide range of toxins, then using a combination product that has both of them in it would be beneficial, and that's your GI detox, okay? Um, in terms of the Bartonella, if we look at studies done um, uh, that got published out of Johns Hopkins University last year, um, there were some studies done looking at what is the strongest um, antibiotic regimens or strongest antibiotic agents to treat what is known as growing Bartonella and also to treat another type of Bartonella, which is called persister Bartonella. So for for growing Bartonella, the strongest antibiotic, there were two. Those two are uh, Zithromax and, or Rifampin. The tetracyclines like doxycycline, minocycline came in really close though, okay? All right. And um, so being on Zithromax is a good idea for that, okay? The MC bar one, I I know there's a number of my, my colleagues that are using that. I've never really had good results with it. It doesn't mean it's not gonna work for you and evidently people are using it, so maybe it does you do want to be on at least two agents. So Zithromax, maybe the MC bar one is a good one. I, I just don't have enough experience using it or I have seen it work well enough, okay? Um, I prefer um, to actually use a second prescription antibiotic. So you could do like a Zithromax and a Rifampin, or you could do, if you want to go herbal, my preference before MC bar one would be to do a combination of two herbs um, called Siddha Akuta and Houtania, I could combine those for instance, okay? Now, my only comment about what's missing in this treatment is the Johns Hopkins research that was published a little over a year. There's two studies. One was, I think, April or May of last year. There was a pub study published in 1999 in December. And that December 1999 study showed that Bartonella has uh, two different growing forms. There are growing forms of the germ and then there are forms of the germ that when exposed to antibiotics will go into hibernation. We call those persisters. They basically slow their metabolism way down and they ignore the antibiotics that we throw at them, okay? Um, now, Zithromax does not have good activity against the persisters. I don't know if MC bar one does because no one's tested it against persisters to know if it does. What I do know works against persisters, and this is based on the Johns Hopkins experiments, is um, essential oils. And the big ones that they've tested, they've shown has good 
good effect against persisters is oregano, cinnamon, and clove. Most recently, I've predominantly been using oregano in my practice, but I'm now starting to work with a combination of oregano, clove, and cinnamon together. And you can get, that comes as a capsule, there's a company made named Dr. Inspired Formulations that has a liposomal cinnamon clove oregano oil capsule. And, um, and I'm, I'm using that. Um, I was using oregano. They are out of stock now. They're not going to be back in stock for a while. So I've moved over to doing this a combination of the cinnamon clove oregano. And based on the Hopkins experience, it should be good. The amount of oregano in this new capsule is the same as was in their old liposomal oregano capsule. So that's when I'm moving all my patients over to. So the only thing I would really consider adding to your treatment whether you stay in the Zithromax bar one, or you go Zithromax for FAMP and get rid of the bar one, or you go Zithromax with Hutania Siddha Okuda, whatever you do with those, and it because those all target growing Bartna, I also would consider adding something that's going to help you with the, um, uh, or what I do in my practice in this situation is I also have people on something that's going to deal with the persister forms too, okay? Now, those oils are also good at breaking up um, biofilm um, that cover the germs as well too, all right? Okay, so I'm going to show you a quick article here. Show you a few things actually. All right, so this is my Lyme disease information site. In terms of ideas that I have for treating Bartonella, take a look at this infection treatment plan section here, and then take a look at um, my article called Kills Bartonella. In here, it does talk about growing and persister forms. And if you're looking at the strongest antibiotics, I outline that. I also talk in here about how to use the Hutania, Siddha Akuda, and the liposomal oregano oil. I need to update the article so it says liposomal cinnamon clove oregano oil. All that have great research from Johns Hopkins supporting them, but that would be one pill twice a day as well too, okay? And then in terms of, let me just show you one other thing. Um, in terms of mold toxin illness and this urine testing I was describing that can help guide you on your binders, take a look at the um, detox section I have here and take a look at this article called Mold and Lyme Toxin Illness where I talk about how to test for mold toxicity and I also talk about what binders for which toxins. Okay, all right. And then finally, one last thing. So this is uh, my supplement store and uh, anyone can order from it. This is where my patients get their supplements, but anyone can order from here. So in terms of the product, I, if you're gonna use the essential oils, I prefer liposomal. And the reason I prefer liposomal um, uh, products, is, especially with the oils, is they get absorbed into your bloodstream better. And if they get absorbed into your bloodstream, that means they're gonna to get to the germs, okay? So the product that I am recommending again, uh, because I can no longer just get the liposomal oregano is this uh, same company making it, it's called Dr. Inspired Formulations. This is their cinnamon, clove, and oregano uh, product that has as much oregano as what I was using in their original product, okay? But this would be one pill twice a day, okay? anyone can buy from here. So if this does interest you, oh, the other thing about my supplement store, if you ever are just wondering what curcumin do I recommend or what is a good quality product for L-theanine, um, come here. You can, you can see what I have hand selected, what kind of things I consider to be high quality products that um, work based on my experience, but also it should work based on how I know the companies uh, source their materials and the product and what they put in their capsules. Okay. So any, so you can just take a look here and you'll be able to find these things. Okay. All right. Let me move over here. All right, Katie, good luck to you.
Hello, Natalie. What's the physiologic mechanism behind the Babesia air hunger and head pressure squeezing? Is it the air hunger? Is the air hunger a brainstem issue? Boy, I wish I knew. Um, I That is one of those questions I have tried of looking into the science for a long time. I don't honestly know. Uh, so everyone, when people have this uh, blood parasite infection you can get from a tick bite called Babesia, in some people, there is a sensation, a feeling of air hunger. They can't get enough air, okay? They have periods when they're at rest or not having activity where they just feel they can't get enough air. And it's a very common symptom, um, but they usually have normal oxygen levels um, and they normally have good heart function. So it does not appear to have something to do with the actual having enough oxygen in your blood. or So, it's not clear to me. I honestly don't know, uh, other than I acknowledge it's a symptom. And the probably the head pressure uh, squeezing feeling is probably more related to uh, inflammatory effects of the Babesia. And it might also be related to the uh, increased inflammation from cytokines um, uh, that a Babesia triggers. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, Natalie. Hello, Lawrence. Let's see how Dr. Ross. A couple questions. First, you often see tachycardia pots with Lyme and co-infections. If so, does it tend to persist after treatment or does it typically resolve when one starts feeling better? Let me talk about that real quick. So POTS, everyone, stands for uh, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. It's a big mouthful. But it basically means is you've got some dysfunction in what is known as the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, the sympathetic is adrenaline, parasympathetic is anti-adrenaline. They balance each other out, okay? And in Lyme, it's possible to get infection of the nerve called the vagus nerve that regulates the balance between adrenaline and anti-adrenaline. And Babesia, um, although it's not clear to me the mechanism by which it does, Babesia also can give a lot of imbalance between your adrenaline, anti-adrenaline, or the sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system too. So it's not the it's not that everyone with Lyme or everyone with Babesia gets these symptoms of uh, POTS, but a significant number of people can get symptoms of POTS. Okay, so what are POTS symptoms? Well, because you get uh, surges periodically of adrenaline, you can have racing heart. Um, and because the adrenaline, which is supposed to help maintain your blood pressure, sometimes just drops all of a sudden because there's too much anti-adrenaline or too much effect of the parasympathetic system, a lot of times people with POTS will have periods where their blood pressure just drops. They, they'll be standing up and they get really lightheaded, dizzy because their, their blood pressure drops and they'll get enough blood, brain going, um, blood going to the brain. So the two common effects can be a variable heart rate that sometimes races and sometimes goes slow and getting a lot of lightheadedness when you stand up. Those would be the, the big symptoms that make you think of POTS, okay? All right, all right. So does that get better with treatment? I, majority of people it does. And in fact, as you get the germs under control, the majority of the time um, that the POTS will resolve, okay? Now, while you're being treated, there's things you can do to manage that POTS. So if your POTS predominantly is a, um, fast heart rate condition, sometimes being put on heart medicines that are known as beta blockers, like toprol, metoprolol, atenolol, those things, can, uh, pro, uh, propanolol, um, all of those uh, sometimes can limit the heart from racing so much, okay? Sometimes if we put people in a lot of salt, a uh, teaspoon, two teaspoons a day of salt, all that salt that you take in results in more water being held in your blood vessels to expand blood volume so that there's more blood so so that when you stand up there's more blood to go up to your brain you don't get lightheaded and dizzy okay uh for some people compression stockings will help some people gradually increasing exercise will help um, sometimes we have to use um uh, medicines that help the adrenals hold more salt in the body. So we can use something called uh, florina, for instance. Um, there are some other heart medicines that might help as well too, okay? But 
In addition, one of the things that can be helpful from a uh, more alternative integrative medicine standpoint is to take a medicine which is known as low-dose naltrexone. Uh, naltrexone is a narcotic blocker that blocks what are known as endorphin receptors on our immune cells, and which causes a re-regulation of the immune system so that um, it is more balanced. And sometimes that can help with POTS as well too. Not in everyone, but sometimes it can. Um, I'll show you an article about how to use that. But if you're going to try the low-dose naltrexone, you need to give it at least six months to see if it's going to make a difference. Okay. All right. So let me just do a quick screen share here. All right, so let me see. I think I have an article on POTS, but let me see. Yeah, I do. Okay, so this is my article on POTS. And um, take a look here. I talk about the different medicines. I talk about different steps that you can use to manage it. And I have a video that goes with it as well, too, okay? In addition, um, let's see, there was one other thing I was going to show. Oh, low-dose naltrexone. So take a look at my immune system chapter. And here's the article on low-dose naltrexone that you can take a look at too, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Lawrence. Oh, you have a second part. Second, let's see, regarding tinnitus, do you often see that with Lyme co-infection, especially in folks with neurologic symptoms, and does it tend to get better along with the treatment or does it take longer to resolve, resolving when other neurologic symptoms get better? Thank you. So tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears or buzzing in the ears, is kind of tough in this disorder. Um, I give a better chance of the POTS resolving than I do the tinnitus, although the tinnitus can resolve, okay? Um, I would say probably about, uh, well, I don't even, I'm not even gonna be able to give odds here, but I give better chances of the POTS getting better than the tinnitus. The trouble with tinnitus is that if sometimes Lyme results in injury to the nerves that remain leading to having that buzzing uh, or sound, um, ringing in the ears kind of sensation. So sometimes it does not always get fixed. And, you know, even in the world of conventional, even in the world of non-Lyme, tinnitus, once it's there, is a hard condition to treat. So common things to do for tinnitus is avoid caffeine and avoid alcohol. Sometimes that can make a big difference, okay? For some people, acupuncture can make a difference. For some people doing a type of um, osteopathic uh, medicine therapy called cranial sacral therapy, which is going to either an osteopathic physician or massage therapist that are trained in this technique of putting just very light pressures on the head to change a fluid flow around the brain. Sometimes that can make a difference for tinnitus. And then there's an herbal medicine also that sometimes will help, and it's maybe about 50% of the time it will help, and that's to use a ginkgo biloba, um, 80 milligrams twice a day. Um, the ginkgo um, makes it so you have uh, the blood flows easier into the smaller air blood vessels, including the ones that feed your hearing nerves, basically, okay? So those are all things that can sometimes make a difference for it too, okay? All right, good luck to you, Lawrence. Hello, David. Let's say hi, Dr. Ross. Would you recommend treating Bambesia and Bartonella at the same time, or is it better treating them separately? My doc suspects both might be active, but he's not sure. So he's thinking of treating them both at the same time just to cover both bugs just in case. He wants to treat with azithromycin rifampin twice a day and malaron 250 milligrams once a day. I see in your website you recommend different higher doses for azithromycin, rifampin, and malaron. Are the dosages for these medications dependent upon weight? Would these lower doses diminish lower efficacy of eradicating these bugs? How many months would you treat for the lower doses? My weight is 184 pounds. So I wouldn't do lower doses um, for any number of months. Um, you're, you're a good sized guy. 
Um, so first of all, he's, he's dosing, in my opinion, he's dosing way too low. Um, so I want to talk a, about a couple of things. So azithromycin and rifampin together can be a good Bartonella treatment, but I like to dose at 500 milligrams minimum on the azithromycin and um, 600 milligrams total in a day, and you're doing 300 here um, on the rifampin. So you're half the dose, okay? Malarone can treat is a combination product that has something called a tovaquone in it and proquinol in it. And that usually is dosed at twice a day when we're treating Bambesia, not one time a day. It used is used one time a day when you're treating malaria, which is what it's designed to treat, but it's not really going to be that effective at one time a day. You have another problem here, though, in that I would not mix rifampin with malarone. And the reason I don't mix rifampin with malarone is rifampin alters the metabolism of the atovaquone in malarone, and it makes it so that you may have lower drug levels of the atovaquone. In other words, it lowers the effectiveness of the malarone. So therefore, I tend not to combine those two together. The other thing generally when I have found in my practice is if somebody has active Bartonella and active Babesia, it is better to go after malarone first, start seeing improvements in the, in the uh, Bartonella symptoms before you add in treatment for Babesia. And that is an observation that uh, one of the Lyme pioneers in this country had, his name is Burriscano. Burriscano was a Lyme pioneer out in New York State that used to practice out there. But his observation in his practice was that if he tried to get rid of um, Babesia before getting Bartonella under control, it made it very difficult to get rid of the Bartonella, okay? So usually what I'll try to do is make sure I'm starting to get some of my improvement on my Bartonella symptoms first before I add in treatment for the Babesia. That's my general approach, okay? All right. So um, yeah, good luck. Good luck. with. Uh, I would go back and retalk with your doctor again. You might even want to show him some of my articles where I've been very clear about the dosing and why you would want to start uh, more with uh, a Bartonella over Babesia first, okay? And then finally, typical rule of thumb is Bartonella, um, when the drugs are working, is going to take about four to six months to clear. But by one to two months, you should start seeing some improvement in the Bartonella symptoms, okay? Babesia typically is four to five months to clear, but again, by one to two months in, you should start seeing some lifting of the Babesia symptoms, okay? All right. So what are Bartonella and what are Babesia symptoms? I'm Rather than going through it right now, I'm just going to show you an article where you can take a look at that. All right, so <clears throat> take a look at my chapter, my section here called How to Diagnose. And there's one for um, how to diagnose Bartonella, another one on how to diagnose Babesia. Both of these have symptom lists of symptoms that will be active and symptoms you should follow while you're being treated, okay? All right, David, good luck to you. Thanks for the question. Hi, Anna. Let's see. Dr. Ross, thank you for helping us. My latest Armin CD57 test. Was, and I'm trying to percent. Okay, so the number I focus on is that CD57 NK cell absolute, that number, okay? And what a CD57 is, everyone, is a specific type of white blood cell that is low um, about 80% of the time that somebody has chronic active Lyme disease. Um, and um, But I will warn you, there may be other things that cause it to be low too. And some of those other things may be chronic virus infections, for instance, like Epstein-Barr cytomegalovirus. So when it comes back low, it is, does not necessarily prove you have Lyme, but it is something we see about 80% of the time in Lyme. A number under 150 is what I consider to be low. And my, many of my colleagues, it'd be 100 or 150 is what they choose, okay? Now, 
I do not find it to be a useful test. So let me talk about that real quick. So when this test was first developed over 10 years ago, we thought it would give us a way of following how a treatment was working. And what we thought would happen is if we were to test it every few months and, and somebody was getting better, we thought that we would see it getting better. And so we thought that if it was rising, that might indicate that somebody's getting over their line. But there have been subsequent studies that were done looking at this CD57 level. And there's two things that we discovered from the testing, okay? Number one, CD57s tend to go up and down around a flat line, okay, or a horizontal line. They may go up and down around 30%. That's just the natural variation, up and down 30%, all right? And then if they are gonna go normal, it's usually gonna be at the end of the treatment when you're feeling really well, they'll skyrocket up, okay? So they don't rise steadily like this, okay? All right. Secondly, what we've discovered is if you were to test somebody's CD57 and you were to do it multiple times, you were to do it, um, do that test, run it through the machine multiple, draw the blood, run it through the machine multiple times, there would be a range of about a 30% over what the number actually is. So for instance, if the lab reports it's 100, the real range of that test, what it could actually be is anywhere from 130 to 70, all right? That's a 60 point difference, all right? So now if you start trying to measure these things every few months to see if you're getting better, and it has this range of 60 points, for instance, that it can vary, and you, on the one time you tested, it was 100, the next time it was 70, and the time after that, it was 130. Remember I said this original number could be actually really be 130 to 100. It may not represent any changes at all. So it's useless to use to follow where you're going for two reasons. There's too much natural variation in the range. And number two, it doesn't tend to rise as you're getting better. If it is going to go up, it's right at the end of treatment. So I don't do them. And I, I honestly don't understand why a lot of my colleagues even bother testing them, to be quite honest with you. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Anna. Um, yeah, I think that's enough to be said about that. Hello, Megan. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Does a person have to have very high levels of uh, heavy metals in order to have symptoms directly indic indicative of those heavy metals, i.e. neuropathy, or can lower levels still make a person symptomatic and or adversely impact organ systems? Number two, have you had patients take the COVID vaccine who have been on on something one year of prescription antibiotics for Lyme and co-infections and who remain on the antibiotics during their vaccination? If so, how have you seen them respond generally? Okay, so uh, I'll answer the second part first. So um, when anyone, whether they have Lyme or doesn't have Lyme, get the COVID vaccine, the COVID vaccine, whether it's Moderna, Pfizer, or um, Johnson & Johnson, will trigger a cytokine response, okay? Remember, as I've described on these webinars many times, the reason you feel bad in Lyme is that the Lyme germ triggers your white blood cells to make inflammation chemicals called cytokines. And those cytokines are good and bad, okay? On the good side, cytokines tell the immune system to start attacking the germs. They draw those uh, immune cells to where the germ is and they help them work better. On the downside, in Lyme disease and in mold toxin illness and in too many yeast in the intestines, the immune system sometimes doesn't do a good job and it tries harder and harder and it makes too many cytokines, all right? So symptoms of too many cytokines are brain fog, sleep disturbances, body pain, severe fatigue, hormonal disturbances, you see, see, I mean, just from that list, can you tell what we call Lyme symptoms are really too many cytokine symptoms, okay? Now, when you get the vaccine, your immune system is going to react because we want it to. We, we want to program your immune system to react to COVID. And as a result of the vaccine and, and teaching your immune system to react to COVID, guess what your white blood cells are going to make right after you get the vaccine? Cytokines, okay? So, you're going to have, and whether you have Lyme 
or don't have Lyme, you're going to have increased cytokines, which may give you flu-like symptoms, may give you fatigue, may make you hurt all over, et cetera, okay? And we're finding that in healthy or Lyme patients, when you get your second vaccine, you're probably going to have more cytokines, okay? So for on average, what I'm finding in my practice is whether you have Lyme or don't have Lyme, expect some cytokine flare that tends to be short-lived on your first vaccine, maybe half a day to a day or so, okay? On the second vaccine, it may take two or three days, sometimes up to a week before that gets better, all right? Now, people that have had COVID and don't know they had COVID, if they get the vaccine, we're finding that people that have had COVID um, and get the vaccine have a stronger reaction, okay? So just be aware of that if that happens too, okay? Now, I am advising that my patients with Lyme get the COVID vaccine, uh, regardless of where they are in their treatment, whether they're at the beginning, they've been on antibiotics for a year or more, and generally most people are tolerating them just fine. They're having the same kind of reactions anyone getting the COVID vaccine would. Or I should say, um, everyone is, I've had one person that has had a strong reaction after COVID, but I think there's a different reason for it than the COVID vaccine, okay? But I've only had one. Everyone else seems to be tolerating this just fine, okay? And so being on antibiotics um, for one year, um, I, I would go ahead and get the vaccine. I wouldn't see a problem with that at all, okay? Just be aware, you may flare up. Um, and again, it's the cytokines that flare. It's not your Lyme germ that's flaring, it's the cytokines that flare, okay? All right, let's see, second part of this. Uh, oh, last thing about the Lyme, uh, the thing too. I am suggesting that, uh, again, we want your immune system to learn to fight COVID, okay? So we want it to get challenged by these cytokines. We want the cytokines to turn it on. So you can make an argument that we should not have people on anti-cytokine medicines uh, when they, before they get the vaccine and up to two months, I'm sorry, two weeks, up to two weeks, not months, two weeks, after the vaccine. So things like Cytoquel that some of you are on, or curcumin, or quercetin, and even um, glutathione. I'm advising my patients to stop those about a week before they get the vaccine, and then to try to stay off of them for at least two weeks after the vaccine. So we don't block the effect of the cytokines, turning the immune system on to deal with the COVID. Okay. All right. All right, so second part of your question is here. So in terms of heavy metals, um, it depends on the person. Okay, so when we look at people having chronic illnesses like uh, Lyme and, um, and mold toxin illness, et cetera, the reason people feel sick is because there's a number of things that can add together to give the illness, okay? So, um, so I like to kind of look at it as the rain barrel analogy. So if you put enough water in a rain barrel, it will overflow, all right? So if you put enough things in the I'm not healthy rain barrel, eventually you have un, you have health that's not good. So those things that we can add to the unhealthy rain barrel would be not getting enough sleep. Um, having yeast would be one thing. Having a uh, Lyme infection might have another thing. Maybe sprinkle in a little bit of heavy metal toxicity in there. No, let's throw in a little bit of mold toxins and let's put in a little bit of um, thyroid dysfunction, maybe a little bit of adrenal gland dysfunction, okay? I, I mean, I'm singing the song that most people with Lyme have, right? Oh, and let's put a little mast cell activation syndrome in. Oh, and the, let's put some POTS in there too, okay? Let's, let's just put it all in, all right? So all of those collectively add together to give the illness. To get somebody well does not mean you need to fix every one of those problems or absolutely deal with every one of those problems, okay? So if your rain barrel is overflowing, what we want to do is to decrease the amount of water going in, the amount of things causing your problem, and we want to open up the spigot so it will start to drain out, okay? Um, so we need to work on detox to open up the spigot, okay? And then we need to start killing lime germs so they're not filling up the barrel. But we need to pick things that generally are gonna help lower the water in there, okay? What I have found in terms of that then is heavy metals, dealing with them tends to give the lowest yield. I tend to get the least amount of benefit in dealing with heavy metals. 
I find more benefit in correcting sleep, getting yeast out, lowering cytokines, um, supporting the adrenal glands and the thyroid. I'm treating Lyme and co-infections. And if those things that we're doing don't work, then I think the next step is to start looking at dealing with things like heavy metals. Okay. All right. So again, you don't have to fix everything. You need to fix the big things. And my protocol that I have, the Ross Lyme Support Protocol, says what are the big things you should deal with right away? The other things are tend to give you the least amount of results. So let me show you what I mean by that, okay? So I'm going to show you the Ross uh, Lyme Support Protocol. All right, so take a look at my treatment protocol here. So again, this is a protocol that focuses on all those conditions that fill up your rain barrel, okay? And the ones that I have found that are most important to address. So first of all, up here in my background explanation, somewhere up here, I guess down here, um, I start by saying, make sure it's not mold toxin illness, all right? Because it can look just like Lyme, okay? All right. But then the main things you want to deal with are correct sleep, fix your diet, get your cytokine inflammation under control, be on something to support the body under stress, fix your hormone levels, be on a good multivitamin, do some basic detox supports, exercise if you can. Um, don't need to be on specific immune boosters because all those other steps I just said boost your immune system. Get yeast out and then treat Lyme and the Lyme co-infections. Those are the essential steps, okay? Now, if you're about six months into a treatment and you're not getting better, then it's time to start looking for other causes. And that's this section down here. And this is where I would start looking for mold if you don't know you had it, okay? I would start looking at MTHFR detoxification issues. I would start looking at heavy metals. Um, anyhow, you can, you can see, I even say deal with chronic viruses. And this is where I start talking about, do we need to fix the mitochondria, okay? So these are things you deal with later after you've dealt with the big raindrops up here first, okay? All right, so it's also known as something called the total load phenomenon. It's the total load of things that give you the ultimate bad health outcome. You don't have to fix everything that's loading you. You just need to fix the right ones and uh, you may not have to deal with all of them, okay? All right, thanks for the question. Hello, LM. Let's see, what do you suggest to stop hair loss and eye floaters associated with Lyme? So, so first of all, with the um, hair loss, make sure you don't have a common cause. Number one, the most common cause can be low iron. And, I'm sorry, two of the most common causes, I should say, could be low iron, and the other one could be thyroid dysfunction. So make sure that you've had testing done to look to see if those are the problem, okay? Um, in terms of germs, Babesia bartonella sometimes can trigger hair loss. All right. So you just got to get those germs under control. Um, the other thing I have found helpful in addition to treating those infections and making sure thyroid and iron is okay is, uh, biotin, the vitamin biotin one pill a day can sometimes make a difference for that. In terms of the eye floaters, there is nothing specific it can do other than treating for the infections. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question. Hello, Stanislaus. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. How much 5-MTHF should I take for 50 milligrams of Dapsone per day? I don't have Leucovorin in France. Thanks a lot. So um, everyone, Dap Dapsone, as many of you know, is a prescription antibiotic that we're using to treat persister forms of Lyme. Um, the person that has come up with that idea is Dr. Horowitz out of New York State. He's got a protocol that he's done some research on that shows benefit from combining 
uh, dapsone with um, rifampin and um, um, either doxycycline, which is in his study, or you can use as a substitute for doxycycline, azithromycin, clarithromycin, or minocycline, okay? The difficulty is with dapsone is uh, dapsone is, um, interferes with folate metabolism. And, it may, and if it does interfere badly enough, it can result in having big red blood cells and also triggering anemia, all right? So big red blood cells will show up as elevation of a level called MCV, also called mean corpuscular volume. That stands for the size of your red blood cells. So if you're on a, a dapson regimen and you're starting to see your MCV get large, that probably means you're not, that your folate metabolism is really blocked, okay? What I have found in my practice is a good, I try it when I'm having somebody on dapson and I'm keeping it at about 100 milligrams or lower. I have found taking about 15, one five, 15 milligrams a day of 5-MTHF usually is enough to keep that controlled or to prevent it from happening, okay? So uh, Thorne, for instance, here in the States makes a product called 5-MTHF. They make it as a one milligram and a five milligram pill. I'll have people take three of the five milligram pills, okay? All right, good luck to you, Stanislaus. Hello, Haley. Yes. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm curious, how do people get Bartonella? Ah, good question. So Bartonella um, is a bacteria and it can be transmitted, we think, through ticks, although the infectious disease doctors question that, but there are some studies that suggest that it is transmitted through tick-borne infection is one of the ways, okay? It can also be transmitted by mites, I believe fleas, let me pull my article here. There, so there are other vectors that can spread it as well too. And let me see, I think I have written it down in my article. I don't, I don't always remember these off the top of my head, but hold on here a minute. Let's go to my how to diagnose Bartonella article. I think I put it in there, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so the studies say, it's right here in this sentence, Bartonella can be spread by ticks, animal scratches, uh, so uh, like a cat that is infected with Bartonella, fleas, lice, sand flies, and mites are the vectors that are commonly recognized, okay? Now, I will also let you know that they're, you know, the infectious disease doctors don't quite buy the idea that ticks transmit this, just to be honest with you. Uh, but we think it is. I think there's some compelling evidence that it actually is, okay? All right. All right, thanks for that question. Good luck to you. Oh, Haley, I say one other thing too. There is some concern that Bartonella could be sexually transmitted, but did you notice the word I said could be? We don't have solid scientific evidence that it is, but I will throw that out that there is a concern that it might be. Um, there's some anecdotal reports, meaning we have observed that if a person has Bartonella and they sleep with another person, that sometimes that other person gets it, but I think it's rare to be quite honest with you, but I'll throw that, out, that idea out too, okay? Hello, Anna, let's see. My doctor has me on peptides for three months. I have completed two. I'm worried about getting the vaccine with low immune system. Can you please comment? So Anna, I would need to know more specifically which peptide you're on, because um, they're all doing something different, okay? So I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a comment here. All right, sorry about that.
Hello, Elise. Let's see. Is L-arginine contraindicated via BART and or Epstein-Barr virus? I have both, but was recommended to me for small fiber neuropathy, which I also have. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I honestly don't, I don't know that one off the top of my head. I would have to look into it to see. Um, um, I haven't thought of limiting it in any of my patients, um, but I haven't looked into that specific question before. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question. Hello, Thomas. Let's see, what cancer screening markers do you recommend and when do you recommend looking at them from this long-term immune suppression and dysregulation from Lyme? With so much muscle wasting and significant chronic fatigue, is it something we should consider? Are there any lab markers that distinguish between Lyme and multiple sclerosis? Um, so there are no lab markers that I have found that necessarily distinguish between Lyme and multiple sclerosis because Lyme can trigger multiple sclerosis. So it, it, there's nothing that really distinguishes that. In terms of cancer screening, no one has done studies to tell us what are the cancer screens we should do if you have Lyme to screen for cancer. Likewise, there is insufficient evidence to say that Lyme does trigger cancers, although Dr. Neil Spector, um, who, is, uh, uh, who had Lyme himself, um, had been doing some studies looking at this and has some linkage between, I believe it was breast cancer, he found some link. But in terms of do we have solid evidence of link of other cancers, and even that breast cancer, was it solid? I don't know if that it was solid or not. Um, I would say we don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think we have enough evidence to say there is a linkage or not. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question, Thomas. Hello, James. Let's see. A couple of things that have become more popular in Lyme lately are peptides and PEA. Have you used these in your practice? And what so? What have been the results? So I have not started somebody on peptides myself. Um, and as I've studied it to consider doing it, I'm, I, I have questions as to whether it really is beneficial or not. So I have not done it. Um, I'm waiting to see if we're going to get some more evidence that they actually are beneficial before I add them into my practice. I know a lot of people are starting to use them under the idea that they might help repair damage of tissues, um, that they might somehow turn on the immune system. But I, I just don't know if there's enough there to prove that they are going to be beneficial and they're really costly items to be using as well, too. Um, I have had some people that have been on them, started by other providers, and um, there's a whole group of them. And generally, I'm just those people that have come to see me that have been on it, started by other providers, really have not gotten great results. OK, that, that's been my impression. I know that um, Dr. Ken Holtorf, um, who practices at a Holtor Medical Group down in California, is a big proponent of them. He's also financially invested as a medical director in a company manufacturing them. Um, so <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to say he's doing anything fishy, but um, he obviously believes quite strongly in that. But I can't say myself whether they're good or bad at this point. OK, all right. Thanks for that question. Hello, Jen. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Would you please explain your general approach to treating mold toxin illness? Yeah. So, so first of all, my approach is a, is different than the shoemaker approach. Okay. So everyone, you may be familiar. There's a physician that first discovered mold toxin illness called Richie Shoemaker. And there are a bunch of people out there that are trained in his approach, but there's a problem. Um, Dr. Shoemaker doesn't believe in Lyme disease, and his practitioners are not the most skilled at considering what to do when somebody has Lyme thrown in. Okay, so what the Shoemaker approach is, real quickly, is to look at and see, uh, look at a genetic marker to see if you might have a genetic predisposition for developing the problem, 
and then also to measure a bunch of chemical inflammation markers like C4A, C3A, um, uh, TGF beta 1, um, MSH, uh, anyhow, a bunch of markers to look at um, whether there are signs of ongoing inflammation in the body. Okay, that's the Shoemaker approach. The problem with the Shoemaker approach is Dr. Shoemaker misses the point that if you have chronic Lyme in you, it may also trigger some elevations in some of those chemical markers that his, his trained physicians use to diagnose mold toxin illness, all right? So my approach, and many of us in the world of Lyme disease, what our approach is, is not to do a Shoemaker inflammatory marker genetic predisposition approach. We actually go right to doing the test to see if it's in you, okay? And so the in you test is to do a urine test to see if you have uh, urine, if through your urine, it shows that you're peeing out high levels of mold toxins. Now, your urine, your kidneys can remove mold toxins to a degree, but they're not gonna get rid of all of them. There's a small amount that they can remove, but it still gives us an idea whether you have uh, excess mold toxins in you, all right? So I like to do, to figure out, first of all, if somebody has uh, mold toxin illness, I take a good history. If it's obvious to me that they got sick when they got exposed to black mold in their bedroom and they had been doing great before then, then that says black mold illness to me. And um, I usually will test for it right away. I sometimes will even treat for it before I treat for Lyme. Because sometimes if you get the black mold out, even though they may test positive for Lyme, it's more of a black mold problem, not a Lyme problem, okay? The immune system may have dealt with that Lyme, for instance, okay? So step one, try to figure out if you have it. And that would be to do a urine mycotoxin test. The two labs I like using for that are Great Plains and real-time labs. I am finding as I work with these tests more and more, I become, I am more in favor of doing the real-time. I think there's, uh, I think there's more accuracy in, and they have a better ability of picking up the broad range of mycotoxins a little bit better than I think the way Great Plains does. It's a bit more expensive, but I think it's a bit more of an accurate test. And I say that just um, based on working with it, okay? All right, All right. number two, uh, depending on what your mold toxins are, will determine what you're gonna use to bind them. So step two is bind them, pull them out. So you've got to grab hold of the, uh, as I explained earlier tonight, um, you want to grab hold of the mold toxins that have worked their way out into the intestines before they get reabsorbed, all right? And depending on what your toxin profile is, will help determine which binder you might want to use, all right? So get your urine test, see what your mycotoxins are, and from that, determine which binders you might want to use. You might want to use just betonite clay. You might want to use activated charcoal. You might want to use cholesterol. You might want to use... Um, um, pectin powder could work too. Okay. All right. And then you want to do the, all right. So then you're going to use your binders, try to work up to at least two times a day, maybe three times a day and, um, be on that for about three to six months, somewhere around six months, go back in and recheck again, do repeat your mycotoxin test. If you've been persistent about using your binders, but yet you're not getting any better physically. And if the mycotoxins come back still elevated, then that suggests you might have a second problem, which is not only do you have mold toxins in you, but you might be your own mold toxin brew pup. And what I mean by that is sometimes when we live in environments that have mold in them, sometimes those mold spores will get inside of us and they colonize our nose passages or they might colonize our intestines and we now start producing our own mold toxins, all right? The trouble is we don't have good testing to prove you've got um, the, the mold living in your sinuses or that you have, uh, that is causing the problem, I should say, and uh, mold living in your intestines, that's causing the problem. We don't have that kind of test. So we have to figure out that you have it by excluding, uh, by trying to remove all the mold toxins first. And if we try removing them long enough, and they're not going down, then you have to assume you're probably producing them on your own. If you are producing, then I'm gonna do about three months while I continue to use binders. If you are producing, I'm gonna put you on something probably itraconazole, which is a prescription antifungal medicine to get rid of the funguses in your, or the fungi in your um, intestines. 
It can also help get rid of the fungi up here. But for your nose, I may do an amphotericin nose spray. I may do um, an itraconazole nose spray. I might do a nice statin nose spray. But I would do those for about three months, okay? That would be my approach, all right? While you're doing this, you want to lower cytokines. So I like using curcumin to do that. A product made by Thorne called Mariva 500, 500 milligrams three times a day. I like to use glutathione to lower those cytokines, and glutathione can also help the liver to process some of these toxins out, but it's not going to get rid of them. And that would be to do a liposomal uh, glutathione. The product I like for that is made by uh, Research Nutritionals. It's a product called TriFortify. It's uh, five milliliters and one teaspoon once a day. Sometimes you go twice a day, okay? Um, the other part of the approach is if you have mold toxins built up in you, you want to make sure that you're not living in a building that's still giving them to you, okay? So you need to get a home study done by a mycotoxin, a company that's skilled in studying your home to see if you have mycotoxins in there or mold, mold issues in your home, all right? Um, and if you spend a lot of time in a work environment, you may also want to have the work environment studied too, okay? So that's what my approach is, all right? All right, good luck to you, Jen. Thank you for that question. Hello, Anna, let's see. Worried I won't be able to get the COVID vaccine as the immune system is so low. Don't know if any research trial studied this. Lyme doctor has put me on peptide injections for three months. Finish, oh, I think I already talked about that earlier. Um, so yeah, anyhow, thank you for the question. Hello, Geraldine, let's see. I'm taking herbal microbials for Lyme. I have muscle soreness from Lyme in my neck, shoulders, back, and especially on my ribs. This has been there for quite a while. Does it go away or are you just stuck with it to some extent? What is the cause of the rib area pain? All right. So the pain is, is usually um, inflammation related, either of the muscles, the connective tissues, or your nerves. And that would be related to the infection. Treating the infection generally will help those get better. In addition, Lowering the inflammation chemicals triggered by Lyme can help too. And that would be to be on something to lower those cytokines. Again, I like using a thorn product called Mariva 500. That is a liposomal uh, curcumin uh, pill. Curcumin, which is a derivative of turmeric, gets inside of your white blood cells and turns down their uh, production of cytokines. Okay, It's a 500 milligram pill and you do uh, one pill um, three times a day on that, sometimes uh, two pills three times a day. The other thing that can happen is sometimes all this inflammation triggers muscle spasm, and so you can help with that by being on magnesium. I like being on a combination of magnesium citrate and magnesium malate. The product for that is a product by Thorne called uh, magnesium citramate, and um, I usually have people do uh, three to four pills of that a night, which is about 450 to 600 milligrams of magnesium. The reason I have people do that, it's a muscle relaxer, number one, but also um, magnesium before bed helps with sleep. Okay. All right. Um, so those are just some general things to think about, Geraldine. Uh, thank you for that question. Hello, Jen. Let's see, how long can one safely take artemisinin using the pulse schedule? Three days on, 11 days off that you recommend? You know, I, I have used it um, anywhere from about six months up to a year on a patient before. I never had any difficulty with that. Um, so I, I think it's safe for a long-term ongoing use, actually. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Jen. Hello, Meg. Let's see. Me, Lyme, four and a half years. I'm very concerned about getting the vaccine. Four unrelated people I know in the same town got shingles after getting the vaccine. I've been on a special anti-inflammatory diet for almost four weeks, and I'm feeling much better. I don't want to slide backwards by getting the vaccine. 
Should I get the uh, shingles vaccine first? Could I wait for the COVID vaccine until there is more research? So Meg, it's all a very personal choice. There isn't any shoulds here, okay? The, the main thing we know, what we know is COVID's out there, people die from it, and they get bad health problems, okay? In fact, there's even studies starting to show that people that had mild COVID or didn't even know they had COVID are now starting to develop post-COVID issues. Post-COVID long haul syndrome is starting to happen with some of those people, okay? So we have to weigh out the damage from COVID versus the potential risk of a decline from getting the COVID vaccine. As I explained earlier tonight, in general, I am not seeing people have bad consequences from getting the COVID vaccine when they have Lyme. Um, there are some outliers on that. I, I have to admit that. People will have some flare up in their cytokine levels, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but I haven't seen anyone be worse off in the end after they got the vaccine. In my experience, and I know a lot of people that have gotten COVID vaccines, I have not seen anyone come down with shingles. I cannot explain that. The data that has been done looking at um, adverse outcomes in the two months that these were studied did not show that there were increased risk of getting shingles. And so keep in mind that is your, that, that is occurred in your, you know, with your friends, but that may be an oddity regular than a, a, a true increased risk. Because if we look at the studies that were done, those kind of adverse consequences did not happen in the two months that it was actually done. Um, regarding getting the shingles vaccine, I can't say yes or no. I have no data that guides me on that, but in general, I don't think you need to. I think that this, um, although it did happen to four people you know, I don't think that's a regular occurrence that happens for people if we look at what the data says, okay? Um, could you, I mean, yeah, you could wait if you wanted to see if there somehow is more data that's out there, but then you prolong your risk of getting COVID and having bad consequences for that. So it's just, it's a difficult place we're all in in terms of having to make decisions here. All right, all right. Thanks for that question, Meg. Good luck to you. Hello, Elizabeth, let's see. Hold on here just a minute, everyone. Um, dear Dr. Ross, would you have an opinion on blood ozone 10 pass for Lyme? Thank you. So um, I have a mixed opinion. And so let me tell you, there's two parts to it. So ozone, everyone, is an oxidation medicine that we give people. We know from laboratory experiments that if you fill up a test tube or a Petri dish full of, of bacteria, and then you put ozone on it, all those bacteria will die. And so a lot of doctors out there think this is the solution for all kinds of infections. Let's just pump ozone into people, all right? But guess what? If you do test tube experiments in the lab where you fill up those test tubes full of bacteria and then you put small amount of blood in that test tube and then you put the ozone in, there's no killing, none, none at all, all right? So these doctors that somehow sell you on ozone because it's killing your germs in your blood, like Lyme that lives in blood or Lyme that lives in your tissues, I think are selling you a bag of goods, to be quite honest with you. If we look at, um, okay, so that's one part of it, okay? Part two, and, oh, and the, the guy that did the, uh, the, this is very interesting. So the, the, the guy that is considered to be the expert on ozone for all conditions, whether it's infections, Alzheimer's disease, brain health, mitochondria function, or whatever, um, he, I think he's an Italian physician, if I'm right. He's the one that did this experiment to look at whether it actually kills, all right? And he's the one that showed in his experiments that it doesn't kill. He has published a whole manuscript on what ozone does, but he does not include killing germs in it unless, unless, it's for topical infections. Like if you put ozone on your skin and you've got an infection there, it'll kill the infections there, all right? But if you, again, if you put a little bit of blood in, or if you put the ozone in blood, because what happens with blood is your blood is full of antioxidants that neutralize the killing effect of the ozone. That's what the problem is, okay? Now, do people feel better when they get ozone? About 30% of the time they might, and it can happen pretty quickly. 
And so some doctors interpret that as, aha, I killed a germ. But guess what? When we know about ozone and the, the studies show that it results in better performance of your cell energy factories called mitochondria. Okay. And so it results in better oxygen delivery to the mitochondria. The mitochondria need oxygen to create cell fuel. So one of the ways that people may be getting benefit from doing ozone is it helps your mitochondria work better. It is, and in helping your mitochondria work better, it may be also helpful for the immune system to work a little bit better too. But is this the thing that's actually going to help you long-term? Probably not. Um, the uh, LymeDisease.org, um, which is a group at, in California, has been doing over the last uh, number of years now, has got a, a, a research project that they call My Lyme Data. And what they're doing with My Lyme Data is they're collecting, I think they have about 12,000 people enrolled right now. These are people that have Lyme. They, to enroll in the study, anyone can do it. Any of you could do it. And um, basically you fill out a bunch of question, a questionnaire at the beginning and uh, to populate their database. And then periodically they will go out and select a group of people based on their responses to do further uh, questions to find out, to answer a question. Okay, and two years ago, their question was, have you tried, it was something like, have you tried alternative therapies and uh, how effective were they and did you have side effects? Okay, all right, so let me show you what they found because they've looked at this oxidation medicine question too. And uh, let me do a screen share here. All right. So I'm trying to figure out where I put that article. Hold on here, man. Alternative. Yeah, here we are. So the article that I've written about this based on the data from LymeDisease.org is called What Works? Navigating Prescription Alternative Medicine Lyme Treatments, okay? And I talk about their study, but one of the things, and it's a chart, it's gonna be hard to read here, but I'll just, I'll show you. So they have a section here called oxygen therapies, ozone. And what their study showed is that 40% of people had moderate or found it to be very effective, 40%, okay? By comparison, rife machines were 35%, colloidal silver, 34%, hyperbaric oxygen, 22%, stem cell therapy, only 3%, okay? Um, Let's see here, where's the other one? They also did hyperthermia, oh, hyperthermia. So like going to Germany to, to get really hot and their hypothermia treatments, 45% of people found some benefit by doing that, okay? So this is real data. I mean, this is data collected on people that have tried these things, okay? So it isn't just me that's skeptical about ozone. This data says it helps maybe about 40% of people, okay? now. LymeDisease.org in another study tried to figure out what is it that really does work? What got people well? People that got better or well, of all the things they did, what was the thing that seemed to work the best? And guess what that is? That's antibiotics, okay? So, and the people that got better, got well or responded high, the high responders, people that had good outcomes, 59% of them used antibiotics. Of the people that got well, it was 76% of them that used antibiotics. And the duration of using antibiotics that seemed to get people well is one year or more, okay? So I know that there's a lot of opposition to people using antibiotics that don't wanna use antibiotics. But if we look at what the data tells us, the data says that your best way of getting a good outcome from this thing still is to use antibiotics. and. Um, uh, but I will also tell you, they didn't break down whether people were using herbal antibiotics or not. And I contend, at least based on my practice, that you don't always have to use prescription antibiotics, but um, using um, herbal antibiotics will work as well, too. So anyhow, just some thoughts. OK, so it might help, but I don't think it's helping from killing germs uh, based on what the science actually tells us. Um, the other thing I would worry about is if you do repeated amounts of it, it's an oxidizing agent, OK? So you know what ages us, it's oxidation. Uh, our cells get oxidation damage and that's what ages us. So you're getting putting an oxidation agent in you, you're probably aging yourself as well too, okay?
All right. So keep that in mind. All right. Good luck to you, Elizabeth. Hello, Karen. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Thanks for sharing your outstanding knowledge. Um, you're welcome. I see my doctor has me on Doxy and Luke Methylene Blue and Nystat. I'm not sure what you mean by LEUC and LDN and Dapsone and Disulfiram. There are a number of things there. See, my Bartonella test came back negative, but because of my horrible foot pain and foot neuropathy, he started me on Sita Acuda and Hutania. A few hours after taking these herbs, I sweat terribly. Is this a good sign that I do need do indeed have Bartonella? Um, not necessarily. Um, so the Sita Acuda in this might kill Lyme too. And so it could cause a Herxheimer from that. Hutania, although I would never use a whole treatment uh, for Lyme built around Hutania, it may have some weak abilities to kill on Lyme as well too. Okay, so no, it does not prove you have Bartonella. I want to just caution you on one thing. If you have bad neuropathy, you need to be careful with that disulfiram. Disulfiram causes neuropathy. About 15% of people on disulfiram get neuropathy. And what I'm starting to see in my practice is even when I do things to try to prevent that from happening, about 1% or 2% of the time it can become permanent neuropathy. Okay, so you might want to bring that up with your physician. Okay, all right. Um, good luck to you, Karen. Hello, Natalie. Let's see. What's the physiologic? Uh, we went through that earlier. I don't know. Hello, hey, Lacey, what's the safest binder to start before you have bowel test results? So before you know what your specific um, toxins are, I probably would try to use a mix of binders that covers the full range. And that product I like to use is a product made by uh, Biobotanical Research, which is called GI Detox Plus. And it has in it uh, clay, activated charcoal, um, actually, let me see something here. I think it's got more than that in it too, but I'm blanking here all of a sudden. Hold on a minute. I'm going to do a quick screen share. I think I'm going to do a screen share. Let's see here. All right. So let's, let's see here. Okay. So... Oh, that didn't pull it up. Let's try that again. So it's G period I period detox. There we are. Okay, so this is the product GI Detox Plus. And what it's got in it is zeolite clay, activated charcoal, um, silica, pectin, humic acid, and fulvic acid. Okay. So this is a really broad spectrum, can pick up about any kind of toxic detox, all right? So this is what I would suggest um, that you wind up doing. And I usually, in my practice, if I'm going to start it, whether I know somebody has toxins or might have toxins, um, I usually will start it at one pill once a day. If you tolerate that um, over seven days and it doesn't flare you up, then I go to two pills one time a day. Seven days later, I'll add a second time of the day. So I'll do two in the morning, one at night. And then seven days after that, I'll go to two in the morning and two at night. Okay. Now, when you use binders, be careful because they're going to bind other medicines up and other supplements up. All right. So I usually have a rule of thumb, which is do not um, take any of your other supplements or medicines beginning 30 minutes before you take your binder, like a GI detox, through two hours after you take your binder. Okay. In terms of eating, you can actually eat any time, but the ideal time would be to eat about 30 minutes after you take your binders. And the reason that's the ideal time is your gallbladder, um, after the liver tries to process these multoxins, it moves them out into the gallbladder. And some of them will stay in the gallbladder. Some of them will get out into the intestines without going through the gallbladder, but some of them will sit there, okay? And so whenever you eat, it causes the gallbladder to contract 
and squeeze the remaining toxins out into the intestines. If you eat 30 minutes after you take your GI detox, the GI detox will have worked its way into the small intestines, um, into the area where the gallbladder squeezes its stuff out, okay? So you're just gonna get a better effect of binding if you do it that way, okay? All right, thanks for our question, Haley. All right, everyone. That's it. Um, I've got to. I've got to head out tonight. I've got some other things I have to do this evening. Um, I've enjoyed spending time with you uh, tonight. Uh, again, I'm. Uh, there is the chance I may have a delayed um, getting the video out to you tomorrow morning because I've got some activities I have to focus on in the morning. Uh, but I'm going to try to before I get to those activities to try to get the video out to you early uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, when you get the email from me announcing that the video is done. Um, there will also be a link to sign up for the next series of webinars. I will be off next week. I'm not, uh, well, not off. I'm going to still be practicing here, but I'm not going to be doing a webinar next week. As many of you know, I do three in a row typically, and I take one week off. So next week is my week off from the webinar. Um, so we will not be doing one here next week, uh, but in the email tomorrow morning, I will have a, uh, a link to sign up for the next series of webinars, okay, uh, which will be next month. All right. So with that being said, that's it. That's it for me tonight. Thanks everyone for these great questions that you had and um, I wish everyone well. Take care, good night.